All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're very happy to have William Donnelly from Perimeter Institute telling us about gravitational edge modes and hydrodynamics. Please take it away. All right. Uh, so thanks for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, connections between uh, gravity and specifically edge modes of gravity, which I'll explain, and hydrodynamics. And this is based on a paper that came out in December with Laurent Fadel, uh, Anthony Speranza, and Farouk Moussavian at, uh, at PI, although uh, Farouk is now at McGill. And uh, this is building on some older work, which I've listed here by myself and Laurent Fadel. So the overarching theme of this talk is, uh, is symmetry. So we love symmetry in both classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, classically, in classical mechanics, uh, we have a space of states, which is a phase space. Uh, formally, it's a symplectic manifold. And the symmetries are generated by functions. They're conserved quantities of the system. And they form an algebra under the Poisson bracket. And in quantum mechanics, the story is very, uh, is very similar. It's analogous. We have a Hilbert space of states. Our symmetries, rather than being generated by functions, are now generated by Hermitian operators. And these form an algebra under the commutator. And these two structures, of course, are closely related to each other uh, by this correspondence principle where, Poisson, uh, where commutators are IH bar times Poisson brackets up to higher order corrections in H bar. And so symmetries are uh, an extremely useful tool, uh, not only because they allow us to understand conserved quantities to classify states of our system, both classically and quantum mechanically, but because there's this close parallel between uh, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, insofar as their symmetries go, the symmetries of a system can act as a kind of bridge between classical and quantum mechanics. Okay. And I should say, please, I, I don't know if there's a policy, but please feel free to interrupt and ask questions uh, whenever. Uh, it's harder to interact over, over Zoom, but it's good to keep some of that interactivity. Yeah, interruptions are welcome. Great. Uh, so. We'd like to be able to apply this basic logic to understand symmetries of general relativity. Okay. And there's a main symmetry that you think about when you think about GR, which is the diffeomorphism symmetry. Uh, but of course, this is not suitable for this purpose. Uh, as we know, diffeomorphism symmetry is really a gauge redundancy. It's not a physical symmetry at all, which is to say that it's represented trivially on the space of states. You apply diffeomorphism to a state, you get not a different state, but the same state. The generators are all just identically zero. And so there's really no useful principle uh, for diffeomorphisms in this way, except that there is uh, when you consider a space time with a boundary. So for example, I've, I've drawn a little uh, system with a boundary here and it's causal diamond. So we take some piece of a Cauchy surface, which I'll call sigma, has some boundary S, there'll be some subgroup of the diffeomorphisms or some set of diffeomorphisms that are vanishing at the boundary. And those are indeed pure gauge. Those are represented trivially. But there'll be some which are non-vanishing at the boundary, which become physical when you put a boundary. So they, these, are these are really physical symmetries of this region. And that's the symmetry group that we want to think about. That's our set of physical symmetries. And one of the places, so understanding symmetries of a system is important generally, but one of the places that this is relevant for information is that we expect these symmetries to play an important role in entanglement. So if we think about entanglement, say not in gravity, but in Yang-Mills theory, the way this story works is that we construct Hilbert spaces associated to regions. We have to include some set of modes known as edge modes, some degrees of freedom, which effectively live on the boundary of our region, which I called sigma. And they will carry some uh, representation of some Lie algebra of symmetries, which I've called G sub S. And the, the importance of these symmetries for entanglement is that when you want to construct the Hilbert space of a larger region, what you do is you, is you tensor together your uh, your Hilbert spaces, as you usually would do, but then you have to quotient by these additional symmetries that live on the boundary, these boundary symmetries. 
or as I'll call them in this talk, corner symmetries. And when you do this quotienting process, you wind up introducing some entanglement between sigma and sigma prime. Uh, in fact, this symmetry algebra is a symmetry of the density matrix of a finite region. And so you can class up, you can split up your whole density matrix according to its symmetries and you learn a lot about the entanglement structure of states. And I think this is suggestive that we should try to do a similar construction for gravity. We don't have yet uh, a notion of a local Hilbert space for gravity, but we have what is the closest classical thing, which is we have a local phase space and we have a symmetry acting on it. And so we can try to um, try to understand how these symmetries act. And so the goal of this talk will be to take the phase space of a region in general relativity and study its symmetry group using the method of co-adjoint orbits. Okay, so just a, just a quick primer on what is a co-adjoint orbit and why we care about it. Effectively, what it is, is it's the closest classical analog of an irreducible representation of a symmetry group. So given a classical system uh, with some symmetry algebra G, it's gonna have some set of generators and these generators themselves uh, transform in the co-adjoint representation. So the, the, if I think of the transformation itself, that's an adjoint vector. And to create, I create a scalar by, by sort of integrating it against the generator. So this is, uh, they transform in the, in the co-adjoint operator because of this, pair, in the co-adjoint representation because of this pairing. Okay. And when I have a phase space with a symmetry, I can construct the so-called moment map, which, and, and all that is, is I take any point in phase space and I read off the value of the different generators. So for example, if I had a translation symmetry, it would be the value of the momentum, which is why it's called the moment map or sometimes momentum map. And using that map, I can foliate my phase space by co-adjoint orbits. Okay. Uh, what is the co-adjoint orbit? Well, it's just the, or it, the generators themselves transform under the symmetry group. So given some, given some point in, uh, given some generator, I can look at the orbit of all other, uh, of all other generators under the action of the group. And the key thing that makes the makes this powerful is that these co-joint orbits have a natural symplectic form on them. So their symplectic manifolds, effectively they're classical phase spaces. And the general end, when you quantize such a thing, uh, what you get is an irreducible representation of the symmetry group. So uh, this is sometimes quoted as a principle of the uh, of the uh, orbit method. In some cases, it can be proven as a theorem. In the case that we're looking at, the method uh, we're looking at infinite dimensional Lie groups. Uh, in that case, there's no such theorem, and yet it's still a very useful thing to do to try to construct irreducible representations using this method. Basically, you construct a classical phase space and you try to quantize it. But it's a basically it's a phase space which is much simpler than the original phase space you started with. And so you build up these building blocks and then you try to construct your, uh, you break up your phase space into these orbits, you try to quantize them and reconstruct the Hilbert space out of the irreducible representations that you construct. Okay. So that's the basic method. So now I wanna talk about the group of symmetries that we're studying. So we're gonna be in four dimensional uh, general relativity, which means our, pardon, our space-time regions are three-dimensional and their boundaries are two-dimensional. And I'm going to further assume that, the, that we have some region whose boundary is a, is a sphere, S2. Okay. So I'm gonna briefly review this work with uh, Laurent uh, where we constructed a phase space for, uh, for the region and its symmetries. Okay. So first off, diffeomorphisms which act in the bulk, as I mentioned before, those are pure gauge. The generators are, are zero on shell. 
The non-zero, the interesting ones are the physical symmetries. So if we take any, uh, any vector field, which is a gen a generating a diffeomorphism, uh, we can expand it near the boundary into a, po a portion. Uh, so the I directions are gonna be pointing out of the boundary. There are two, two such directions. And then there'll be a tangential piece. So these A, these capital indices are pointing along the S2 direction. Can I ask a, just a clarificational question? Yeah. So here you're you have in mind uh, a subregion of the space time of the of some some time slice, for example. And That's then, right. Uh, and the boundary is the S two. That's right. So you have a you have a four dimensional space time. You take some say I take a, a Cauchy surface. I'm going to pick some region of it, uh, sigma, that I that I'm going to cut out. It has a it, it has an S2 boundary. And I'm gonna be thinking about that three-dimensional region as a, as a physical subsystem. Great, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Will, is, is the 3D region necessarily all lying on a space-like slice? Um, uh, let's, let's, let's assume that it is, yeah. I think it's funny because you don't, um, in the derivation, I couldn't point to you to the exact point where you need to use that fact. And so it might be that you could do this more generally, but I think if you really want to think of it as a, if you think about it, like you're, you're imagining something like a case where you have a slice that kind of folds back and meets its, comes back to the future of itself or something like that. Yeah, things like that. And then you would have to think about, then you don't really have independent initial data on those, on those slices. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to imagine that I'm, that you're, they're really just at an equal time slice, but it's a, yeah, I haven't, just because I haven't thought about the, the generalization and I want to be careful. Okay. Uh, one more question I have, is there something special about 4D or you just do that for convenience? Um, it'll be clear what's special about 4D in a little while. And basically what's special about 4D is we understand much better the, uh, the groups that arise acting in two dimensions. So there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a two dimensional diff group uh, and that one in, in two dimensions, it turns out we can make use of results that, that completely classify the, represent, the, the orbits that we need. In, okay. in higher dimensions, in higher dimensions, a lot of what I'm gonna say is will apply. And then you get to this one point where you have to solve a smaller classification problem, say on S3 and the solutions to that problem aren't known. But yeah, I'll, 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 so I'll go through the S2 case and I'll discuss the generalizations at the end. Okay, great. So I'll, um, good. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna call the, the set of diffeomorphisms uh, with non-vanishing generators, the corner symmetry group, because okay. it acts at this, this co-dimension two corner. But, I should mention, yeah, it's limited to S two, which is kind of, kind of nice given that the horizons that we see in our universe are S twos. Um, good. So there are two, there are two different types of uh, transformations with non uh, non zero generators. The first type I'll call normal boosts, and these are vectors. Uh, such that, so they're vanishing at the surface itself. So these are, the symmetries are all gonna preserve the location of the surface S, but there can be a first order piece which is pointing in the normal direction and which is non, whose first derivative is non-zero. So locally, what these transformations do is they do linear transformations of the plane normal to the surface S. So they change the, the and you can do this independently at each point of S. Uh, now it turns out that there's actually so that would be a two by two uh, that would be a two by two matrix transformation a, a GL two R transformation. As it turns out, changes which are just overall scalings are also pure gauge. Uh, and so, in fact, instead of getting GL two R, you get an SL two R at each point. So those are the boosts, and so called because they do what a something like what a boost would do. They transform the 
the time, the TR plane, if you like. Okay, and then there's another class of symmetries, which we call the surface diffeomorphisms. These are not, these are vector fields which are non-vanishing on S, uh, but point purely in the tangential direction. So they still preserve the, the surface S, they just move the points around, uh, shift the points within the surface. Okay. So that's illustrated here. That takes this orange point and moves it over here. Okay. And those form a diff, uh, diff subgroup. And moreover, since the, uh, if you look at the commutator of a boost with a diff, what you get is another boost. Basically the diffs, the boost generators are these local functions and the diffs drag them around. So that's just, that's just the algebra of this class of vector fields. Okay. Well, can I just? Yeah. You didn't comment on the divergence vanishing or did you, I missed it, sorry. The divergence of the uh, of this diff generator. Yeah, that's right because uh, it doesn't have to. Well, so far the structure I'm, I've introduced um, doesn't have like a fixed background metric or something with which you okay. would define the divergence. The divergence will uh, the divergence will come up, but yeah, that's right. For now, in in fact we can construct generators of diffeomorphisms which are not divergence free. Okay, okay, thanks. So those are, those are part of it. Yeah. The, the divergence free condition will, uh, will come later. Okay, and now I wanna talk a little bit about what are the generators of these, of these symmetries. Basically, this is the moment map. I identify what the, you know, the, the Co adjoint vector is what the generator is for each of these vector fields. All right, so to do this, I need to expand my metric in a neighborhood of the surface S. And to do this, I'm going to use this 2 plus 2 decomposition, which is very similar to the 3 plus 1 decomposition you would use in the ADM formalism. Uh, the difference is that, of course, there are two <laughs> normal directions, i and j. So the uh, Laps function is now replaced with a two by two matrix, uh, Hij, which multiplies the, the normal, uh, which is the component of the metric in the normal directions. Um, there's an in, uh, the tangential directions have an induced metric, Qab, and then there's this generalized shift, uh, Va. So in three plus one, it would be just a vector, but now it has both a, a normal and a tangential index. And you can work out what the, in terms of this geometry, what the generators of these, uh, of diffs are and what the generators of the boosts are. So the, the diffeomorphism generator, it turns out is the densitized twist. So it's a vector density and it depends on this generalized shift vector V. Okay. You can think of it as a component of the, uh, it's like a, a curvature component of V, basically. Okay. The uh, generator of boosts is a it's a local so an SL2R co-adjoint object is a two by two traceless matrix density. Okay. So and the uh, that I'm denoting n tilde i j. And it's basically the binormal, it's basically the densitized binormal to the surface with one index up. So that's this, that's this object here. So that's my, those are my, my generators. And one important quantity that uh, we'll be able to construct is the area form. So from the mixed index binormal, if you just take the determinant of, determinant of that, you get up to this factor minus four, uh, the determinant of Q. And so the area form is related to the determinant of this matrix, which in turn is the local Casimir of the SL2R. So, the, so it's, a, it's invariant under boosts, which is not surprising when you write it as the area form on the surface, because that's independent of what you do to the normal plane. But it's it plays an important role in the representation theory of SL2R. Basically, this local Casimir cl classifies your SL2R representations. Okay. 
So now we have, so we have a phase space and we have a group acting on it. Uh, so we, we've identified our generators uh, and okay. And this is the algebra that they, that they form. So the boosts generate a local SL2R at each point, which I denote SL2R to the S, which just means local fun maps from S into SL2R. The diffs generate the algebra just called diff of S of, of vector fields with Lie bracket. And the diffs act on the SL2Rs by, uh, by Lie derivative. Okay. So here's, uh, here's the bracket explicitly. The, uh, if I have a, so C and eta will be the vector field component of two transformations and alpha and beta will be the SL2R components. And the Lie bracket is the, so we have the ordinary Lie bracket of vector fields the Lie derivative of the uh, SL2R generators, and then there's a local commutator of the two SL2R generators. And in fact, the symmetry algebra enjoys some, some universality in the sense that, um, so Anthony uh, Speranza had this nice paper that followed, followed up on the one that Laurent and I wrote, where he, he, sh he showed that in fact, the same algebra arises for higher derivative gravity, basically use this walled uh, another charge formalism to show that in fact that the uh, the algebra is the same. Of course, the individual generators, the charges that generate these things, are do depend on which theory you have. They depend on the Lagrangian, but this uh, this group is in fact the same. Okay. Good. So that's the background. We've established. Uh, we sort of what uh, talked a little bit about what a co-joint orbit is, and we've identified the specific phase space, moment map, and uh, and algebra. And so now we ask ourselves, what would Wigner do? We've got a physical system with a symmetry group. What we should do is we should classify the orbits, uh, the co-joint orbits of their symmetry group. These are classical phase spaces. If we can, we should quantize them. Okay. And the procedure, it turns out, is actually going to follow very closely uh, Wigner's famous result for the Poincaré group and the classification of, uh, of irreducible representations in terms of mass and spin. So apologies for the information dumps, but this is kind of like, this is kind of like the Rosetta Stone of our, of this talk that sort of tells us how to understand, how to take what we know about the Poincaré group, how it generalizes so I'll show how it generalizes to hydrodynamics, uh, a certain group of, uh, of compressible hydrodynamics and how that's closely related to the symmetry group that I've just described. Okay. So um, first let's start with the familiar, with the, the language that, that's probably most familiar to us, uh, which is the, the way we classify orbits of the Poincaré group. So first we can think about a, 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 sis, a physical system which has this symmetry, okay, which in our case is gonna be a relativistic spinning particle. Okay. The Poincaré group acts on, acts on that. Okay, that's the group of SO13 of Lorentz transformations, semi-direct product with the group of space-time translations R13. Okay. So there's a, normal, there's a normal subgroup which is which is acted on by the, the translations are acted upon by the boosts. Uh, so it breaks up into a normal subgroup and then the quotient by that normal subgroup. Okay. And the classification of orbits, so that the, the key players, we have generators of those two subgroups. We have a momentum and an angular momentum. What we, what we wind up doing to classify orbits is we first look at the characters of the, of the normal subgroup, which are the same as the, for an abelian group, that's just the same as the generators. And we look at the orbit of a momentum under the Lorentz group, okay. And now we, okay, we, we uh, here we put some physical input because there are different, different orbits, there are massless orbits or tachyonic orbits or a trivial orbit. Here we're gonna say, let's talk about a massive particle, okay. Oops. Okay, and then the invariant that you get is the mass. Okay, so that's the first label of your orbit. 
And then to get the remaining labels, what do you do? Well, you look at the little group, which is the group of transformations which preserves the momentum. It has a there's a generator of that group. It's basically a a momentum dependent Lorentz transformation. Okay, that's generated by the Pauli Lebansky uh, pseudo vector. And then you construct invariants out of that. And the invariant that you get by squaring the Pauli Lebansky pseudo vector, okay, you already know the mass, but you get a new invariant, which is this thing. And that gives you your class, that gives you your classification of orbits. And each of these orbits that you get is the phase space of a relativistic particle of some mass and spin. And if you quantize that orbit, then you get an irreducible representation of Poincaré of that mass and spin. The story is nearly the same if you think about uh, if you think about hydrodynamics. So there, you imagine you have a compressible fluid. The associated group is diffeomorphisms and local uh, local R transformations. The generators of these you should think of as uh, are physical quantities. They're the mass density of the fluid and the momentum density of the fluid. And you can play the same game where you classify. Uh, classify orbits of the mass density under diffeomorphisms. And the invariant you get is again, total mass. And then you get a further set of, in, you get a further set of invariants. Uh, you look at the, um, you look at the little group, which preserves, uh, which preserves a mass density. And that's the group S diff of, uh, of area of, area preserving diffeomorphisms that preserve the mass density. Uh, so to get back to this, this is basically where uh, Rob's question is, is answered. Why, you know, where did, where does this condition of, of being divergence free come up? And the answer is that the, the divergence free vector fields are basically the little, the Wigner little group uh, within this larger group. Um, the analog of the Pauli Lebensky vector is a vorticity of the fluid. And the invariants that you can construct are known as generalized entropies. So they're, they're moments of, of the vorticity. And this group uh, of diffeomorphisms, semi direct product local R transformations, is just very closely related to the one that, uh, that arises in gravity. The, the key difference is that there's a non-abelian normal subgroup. And many of the results in this, uh, in this um, field assume an abelian normal subgroup for convenience. And it's also the physically relevant, you know, they're largely built out of this Poincaré analogy. Um, so you have to go just a little bit farther to, to study a non-abelian normal subgroup. Okay. But it turns out it's actually quite, it's actually not, a very difficult generalization to do. Uh, what you find is that the normal character, so the thing that was the mass density of the fluid, uh, is the area form uh, of gravity. So it's the area form on the surface. The momentum momentum density, as we saw, is the is the twist density. That's the diff generator. And following the fluid analogy, we can construct invariants. The first invariant that you construct. Interestingly, that plays the role of mass is the total area of the surface. And the little group is the same. It's the group of area preserving diffeomorphisms. There's uh, one additional complication that comes from the non-abelian nature of, the, of our normal subgroup, which is that in constructing the, the vorticity, the analog of the Pauli-Lebansky vector, there's an additional correction that you have to add to make it SL2R invariant. I'll, I'll, I'll explain this last column. Uh, this is just to introduce, I'm gonna explain all of these things in much uh, in, in more detail. But once you've constructed this, uh, this object, this, um, this outer curvature, uh, which is a local scalar, you can construct invariants out of its moments. And so in this way, we can actually classify all the orbits, all the co-adjoint orbits of our symmetry group just in complete analogy with the Poincaré group. So are there any- Question? Yes. Yeah. So 
<clears throat> this middle uh, column that you have is in, in some specific dimensions, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going, well, let's see. I think the thing that I wrote in the middle column would work in any dimension, but I will be thinking about a, so if I want to think about three plus one gravity, then I'm thinking about a, a two plus one fluid. But I think the last entry that we have this enstrophies. Yes. I think they're only true in two plus one dimensions. Ah, yes. No, uh, um, you're absolutely right. Yes, that's true. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, two dimensions. So yeah, that's right. You can get most of the way up up here <laughs> to here. So it's true that s s diff is still the uh, is still the little group. The vorticity is still the generator, but these things, yeah, good. So here I've got a, a vorticity W in bold, which is to indicate that it's a two form. Uh, and here I've sneakily replaced it with a non-bolded version, which is the scalar dual. And only in two dimensions can you dualize the vorticity to a scalar. Otherwise it's a two form. Okay, yes, thank you for pointing. So I guess the far right corner is also in some specific dimensions, this last, uh line that you have, the outer curvature moments, they are only in three plus one dimensions or? That's right, that's right. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise you'd have to try to form other, uh, other invariants. And in fact, I'm not, I don't think there's a complete classification of orbits. There are some invariants you can write down, but there seem to be much fewer. It depends on the whether the dimension is even or odd. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to revisit this at the end. Remind me if I, if I don't, uh, if I don't mention it. Okay, thank you. How, much, how much of what's on this slide depends on higher derivative corrections to the equations of motion? Would it change or not? Good, so um, what changes is the expression for the invariance. So the, the group itself is the same. And so the classification of orbits is going to be the same. So. If I basically what changes is the yeah the expression for the invariance. So if I think about what I would do is I would write if I wrote everything in terms of of just the generators. Uh, so in this case, uh, if well okay I haven't written down the, the the generators but but they were on the previous slide n tilde and p tilde. If I write everything in terms of those objects, the expressions are the same. But then if I wanted to try to write what N tilde and P tilde are in terms of say the metric and fields, they would be different in the higher, they'd have higher derivative corrections. So the correct expression for, for this mass type invariant would be the integral of the square of the your square root of the boost generator. But then the boost generator would be written, wouldn't just be the area it would be the area plus higher, there'd be some higher derivative correction. So uh, is, is that giving you the walled entropy in that case or? Ah, uh, um, oh, this is a good question. I don't, probably Antony would know, uh, but I, I don't actually recall if this expression is the same as the, the expression for the walled entropy. Yeah, good, good question. Um, naively, the wall, naively, the wall, well, like the walled another charge. See, okay, wall, uh, walled is working in this situation where you have a, you have a killing vector in the background. And so really you can identify the thing that you would call the, the you identify the generator with the entropy. Whereas this object that I've constructed is not one of the, it's not a generator, it's the Casimir. Um, so naively, it's a kind of different type of object than, than what Wald would call the entropy. Okay, it's a really good question and I wish I knew the answer. I'm gonna think about it. But can I add, your surfaces are, are not extremal, right? So. I really made no assumption about the yeah. surface other than it has S2 topology and I'm going to assume that it has a. Uh, uh, so so, so at, at best, you'd probably hope for something that we now call wall dong entropy, where there are also extrinsic curvature corrections to the. That's that's right. Yeah. So so right. So when we ask, is it the walled entropy? I guess you would have to ask, is it a is it 
a generalization of the wald entropy and yeah. is it specifically the one that that she wrote down yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't actually know the answer to that good to figure out So this is sort of our this is sort of our plan for the for the next chunk of the talk is just to go through this last column and see how it plays out. Okay. So there are basically three steps in this uh, Wigner method. Uh, so for Poincaré, what uh, what we do is we pick a uh, we look at the normal subgroup generator, which is the momentum. We fix. Uh, we fix the orbit under the action, so we we boost basically we we boost it into a particular frame, and we read off the invariant that we get, which is the mass. Next, we study the little group, which fixes our choice. So then in that case, it's SO three, and we can we classify its orbits. So in the case of SO three, uh, we know what they are; uh, they're classified by the spin. And then the final step is we want to take these invariants and we want to lift them to write invariants of the full group. And the way we do that is we construct the Poly Lebansky pseudo vector. It's like a generator of rotations, but it's it's translation in uh, it's translation invariant. Okay. So normally the angular if you just wrote down an angular momentum, we know that that's not invariant under translations. Uh, it changes when you change the set. It's in reference to some center of rotation that changes here. Uh, this W is invariant, is translation invariant, and so you can use it to construct the invariants of the group, which indeed are the mass and the spin, which you read off from these equations. So these are our three steps, and we're going to follow them almost exactly. Okay. So we first we fix the orbit of a normal subgroup generator under the coadjoint action. Okay. So what is what is a generator of our normal subgroup? So our normal subgroup is these boosts. It's a local SL2R and their generator is an SL2R valued density. I guess technically I should say SL2R star valued density. They're valued in the co-joint. Okay. okay, so that has three, that has a, an index A, which ranges zero, one, two, and it's got uh, that three, that Lie algebra has a, a Lorentzian signature metric on it. Okay. As mentioned, the area density is closely rela is, uh, related to the Casimir. Uh, so the the area form square root of determinant of Q is just this square root of N A squared using this Lorentzian metric. Okay. And now if we are assuming, so here we have to make an assumption that's just like the assumption that you make of choosing positive mass orbits. And here we're going to choose po uh, what we call positive area orbits, basically that the, the determinant of Q is going to be a positive density, basically that the metric is going to be uh, it's going to be Riemannian on our S2. Now this corresponds to taking n, uh, n squared positive, which means n is conjugate to, there are two types of generators. There's a, a rotation type uh, type generator and two, uh, two boost-like generators. There's a, an elliptic and two hyperbolic generators. In our case, it, uh, the choice of Riemannian metric means that we want a, uh, we want a hyperbolic generator. But any hyperbolic generator we can fix to uh, to this particular form. So there's a we're just going to point it, make it point along the one direction, which is our analog of choosing the rest frame of the momentum. Yeah. Uh, there's a subgroup which preserves. Uh, there's a subgroup of SL2R which fixes this choice, uh, and in fact, it has a nice geometric interpretation when you fix. Fixing the generator in this way amounts to fixing the normal metric to be in to be uh, in some particular form up to scale, and the subgroup which preserves it is the the geometric boost which preserves that metric. Okay. And this group was, uh, I think, first in, uh, considered in GR by Karloff and Bunster back in the nineties. And what this fixing does is it breaks our symmetry down to this hydrodynamical symmetry group, this diff S times local R transformations. Okay. And that allows us to, to think about the, the generators here, this N tilde and the momentum as generators in the, in the fluid picture. You can identify with them, them with their fluid counterparts. 
Okay. Now that fixes the orbit of the SL2R generator under SL2R, but we still have to fix its orbit under diff. But now we just, it's just the question of the orbit of an area form under diff. Okay. And there's a theorem which isn't intuitively easy to understand, which is there's only one invariant that you can construct of, a, of, an, area, of an area form under diff. And that's the total area. You basically the only invariant you construct out of an area form is you can integrate it. So you can map any positive density to another positive density of the same total mass. So in particular, you could take your density on S2, which might be lumpy, and you can buy a diff, turn it into the, the uh, density on a round sphere. Those are equivalent. And therefore, there's only one invariant that you get at this stage. So you might have thought maybe there are multiple invariants. No, there's just one. Uh, and it's analogous to the total mass of the fluid or the mass in the concrete. And indeed, it's the area. So that, that gives us the mass part of our, of our mass and spin classification. Uh, so next we have to classify co-adjoint orbits of the little group. Okay, so having fixed a density, the, uh, the group that fixes that is the group of area preserving diffeomorphisms, which is sometimes called S diff. Um, and actually these have a nice, a nice interpretation. Uh, and this is special to two dimensions, that an area form in two dimensions is also a two form. And therefore S2 is a symplectic manifold and the algebra of uh, a vector fields that preserves it is the group of symplectomorphisms or in physics language, canonical transformation. So what we have is we have the, the symmetries of a classical phase space, okay. So we can, okay, so we can think of this as the, the, the algebra, we can think of as the algebra of divergence-free vector fields. It's nicer to parameterize these in terms of a single scalar degree of freedom. Uh, namely, for each diffeomorphism, you, you can write extreme function phi and uh, the, um, the vector field, which I've written here is just the vector field that pushes you along the level sets of phi. And now, if we think of the generator of diffs as momentum, when you change variables to the stream function, the generators are, it turns out, the vorticity of, uh, of the fluid. So it's the, it's the derivative of, uh, of the momentum, which is a two-form, but we'll write the vorticity in terms of this scalar. So we take the Hodge dual, which turns a two-form just back into a scalar. And now there's this, there's a nice result that you can completely classify the, uh, the orbits of S diff. Okay. And the thing that you use to classify them is called the measured rebraph, which I'll, uh, which I'll explain. But if we think about this as classical mechanics, I think it's not too hard to understand what it is. What the way you, if you think of this W as a, uh, this, this vorticity as a Hamiltonian, uh, on your phase space, the way you would classify different Hamiltonians is by ask the invariants that you ask about are you ask about the set of orbits and their periods. And that's basically what this measured regraph tells you. It tells you what are the orbits of this generator and what are their periods. So I'll, um, it's actually easiest rather than giving a formal definition to just give an example, which tells you everything you need to know. So here's, here's a particular generator on this. So I wanna think of the sphere as the set of points x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. And here's an example function on the sphere. Okay. And it's chosen because it has this feature. Uh, so if you look at the orbits, uh, so here's, here's a, here are the level sets of that function. If you look at the orbits for certain values, there are two disjoint orbits, which are a circle. As you change the value, you, uh, you have this sort of figure eight point, and then the, the orbits merge into a single orbit. So here's, here's the same function plotted as a height function. So you can kind of see it's got this saddle in it. Okay. So the graph that you construct has one point for every orbit of your, uh, of your function. Uh, so here, if you look at this energy, and they're labeled by the 
the value of the function. So that you can think of as the energy level. So for energies above this sort of critical energy, we have two orbits and that's, so here you see there are two branches of the graph. When you go through this, through the figure eight, they merge into a single orbit below that energy. And now where's the measure of the, of the measured read graph? Well, what you associate, you can associate basically a spectral density with these things. So the, the measure of some piece of this graph you get by looking at which uh, the sort of space between the orbits and calculating its area. And it turns out the density of that measure is really just the period of the orbit. So basically this is a, this is a list of the orbits and their periods together with a little bit of topological information that tells you how the orbits split and join as you vary the energy. And that it turns out is a complete invariant of, uh, of an area preserving diff give you morphism. So this is analogous to spin classification. Okay. Um, negative period because it's going down. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand. The, 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 den the measure is positive and so the periods are positive. It's the, it, like if I, if I take a piece of this, yeah, the, uh, it's basically the area, there's a, okay, what's the right way to say it? It's, if I, if I take a set on here, like an infinitesimal set, uh, the little infinitesimal piece of this graph, that'll correspond to some region between two orbits here, which has some positive area. And that'll be the, that'll be the, the period. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, and now I wanna, the, the final step is to, once I've got the classification, I want to write the invariance in terms of my original generators. Okay. So for the hydrodynamical group, the vorticity uh, is our invariant scalar. And so what we would construct is, yeah, so we could construct this, scalar and we could construct generalized entropies from it. Those, are, those would be invariants indeed. And, and those are actually encoded in the, in the read graph. Basically, um, yeah, these, these moments really only depend on that measure on the read graph. Okay. So that's our, that's our set of Casimirs for the hydrodynamical group. Okay. For our group, there's one additional step we have to do, which is that if we just wrote down uh, vortic uh, sort of naive vorticity, if we just wrote down DP, that actually is not SL2R invariant. Um, and it's just an analog of the fact that the angular momentum is not translation invariant. You have to, you have to make a construction, which is, okay. And turns out you can do that. And what you do is you just add this, additional term, which depends on the boost generator. Okay. Um, and this is, this is also kind of special to, to SL2R because it uses this epsilon ABC structure constant. Okay. Um, okay, so you can look at the paper if you wanna see why you get this. Also, I mean, there are a few ways to see why this is the right answer once you've, once you've done it. Um, actually one way, which is kind of nice, it turns out this formula is, is the same as the one uh, you would get if you were considering the SU2 George I. Glashow model. So that's an SU2 Yang Mills theory with an adjoint Higgs. Uh, and you break the SU2 uh, down. So you break the SU2 down to U1. And now if you want to write the U1, so if you had a uh, if you had an SU2 field strength and you wanted to uh, Sorry, if you had an S, SU2 uh, connection P and you wanted to write the U1 field strength, this is, this is the object you would write uh, where N, uh, where our, our binormal is playing the role of the Higgs. It's the object. So just like we have SL2R broken down to R by the, by the normal metric, uh, you have the SU2 gauge field broken to U1 by the. By Higgs. So it's kind of a nice 
it's kind of a nice place where some similar, uh, a similar formula, well, indeed an identical formula shows up. And interpretation wise, there kind of isn't an analog of this in hydrodynamics, or at least not, not that I'm aware of, but it's like having an internal component of the vorticity, sort of like having a, it's like you had angular momentum and uh, like a spin type of internal component or something. Good. So there's also a nice interpretation of this object in gravity. Um, so it's it's known as the outer curvature. So if you have a co-dimension two, so it's something you can have if you have a define if you have a co-dimension two or uh, surface. Uh, if you look at the normal bundle of our surface S, we can define a covariant derivative on it. Uh, the covariant derivative defines a connection. So this M are the coefficients of that connection. Okay, those, those objects are tensorial, but you can construct a tensorial object, which is the curvature of that connection. Okay, and that's the outer curvature tensor. So it's got two normal indices and two tangential indices. So IJ are the normal indices, AB are tangential, and it's got this familiar form. That's a cur just the curvature of a connection. And now, if you lower the index i, uh, what you get is you get a tensor which has two normal indices and two tangential indices, and it's anti-symmetric in both, just like the Riemann tensor, right? And because these are both two-dimensional, there's really just one scalar component of this object. So that scalar we'll call the outer curvature uh, w, and it turns out that's precisely the, the gravitational image of this, uh, of the vorticity. So this is this it's this scalar w is boost invariant. It can be constructed out of the, the generator, uh, and therefore you can use it to to um, construct invariants of your. So that's that's our that's our classification of of cojoint orbits. So just to summarize, each cojoint vector, uh, the generators consist of a momentum density. This uh, in gravity, it was a twist density and this uh, at local SL2R value density. The complete invariant that, uh, that you get, you get a mass type Casimir by integrating the, uh, the norm of this SL2R vector. And then you get an additional infinite family of invariants analogous to spin by constructing the vorticity, well, this sort of, if you like, dressed vorticity, which is a combination of P and N. And then that's a function. And then you can look at all the invariants of a function, which are encoded in the measured read graph. And in the gravitational context, this mass is precisely the area. And instead of the vorticity, you just look at the outer curvature scale. And if instead of writing down this graph, which is a bit of a, maybe a slightly obscure object, although not hard to understand, you can construct a bunch of scalar invariants out of it, which sort of almost give you sort of almost all the information, or at least an infinite number of scalar invariants you can write down, which are just the moments of, our, of your function, your vorticity function or the outer curvature. All right. so. So the question came up a little uh, about a couple of generalizations. So I just want to talk about that. So, so far we restricted to S2. Um, the first natural generalization is when S is a higher genus surface. So you can consider a, a torus horizon or something. Um, and there actually you can, again, the classification works. It's just a little bit, well, it's not, it's, there's just a little bit more information you need. Um, turns out the Reeb graph on the, when you, are on the sphere, the read graph is, graph is always a tree. If you're on a torus, the read, uh, the read graph will have cycles. Or if you're on a higher genus surface, there are more cycles to the read graph. And there are a few new invariants you have to consider, which basically correspond to the fact that if you had a fluid on a torus, there would be some total momentum sort of flow uh, around the cycles that you'd have to track. So they're just a, they're a, an additional finite set of invariants depending on the genus. Uh, the higher dimensional case was nicely uh, brought up earlier. And indeed, so there, 
if you want to classify orbits of S diff, it's a harder problem. And I think it's not known in general. Um, and the reason is uh, that the vorticity is not a scalar anymore. It's a two form. And uh, there are fewer invariants you can construct out of a two form. So interestingly, if you're in even dimensions, something that you can do is you can wedge that form with itself some number of times. So say you're in six dimensions and your surface S was four dimensional, you could consider W wedge W. That would be a top form. You could dualize it back to a scalar and then construct something that's very close to the, to the entropies. If you're in odd dimensions, I'm not, the only thing I know that you can construct is something like a churn simons form. Uh, you can look at something like P wedge, wedge DP. Um, but that's not an infinite number of invariants, that's just one. And I don't know if there are, I don't know if there are more invariants or what the classification is. As far as I know, it's, as far as I know, nobody's worked it out in higher dimensions. Uh, but people have considered that churn simons form in, uh, in say three plus one fluid dynamics. Um, yeah, okay. And another interesting generalization is that the group that we've considered, we can think of as the automorphism group of a trivial SL2R bundle. That's, that's what it is. Um, and you could ask what happens if you look at uh, the automorphism group of non-trivial SL2R bundles. And the answer is that there were these, we had these casimirs, right? Where, which started at two because the integral of the vorticity uh, is zero. It's just the integral of DP basically. But if you're in this, uh, if you're in a non-trivial bundle, it turns out that has some, that's an interesting topological invariant and it's not zero. And if you map it on uh, through this gravitational, um, to the gravitational phase space, what it corresponds to is, is it's related to the nut charge. It has to do with having a non-trivial a non normal bundle to your surface S. Um, okay, so one of the motivations, which I can't say much about, unfortunately, is, is quantization. So having classified the orbits and written them down, uh, you'd like to understand how to quantize, how to quantize them. Um, so we don't know how to do that yet, but one nice clue is that this little group algebra uh, S diff of S2 uh, is, a, is you know, one of the nicest infinite dimensional Lie algebras. Um, it's an algebra of symplectic transformations of a compact phase space. And we know how to quantize something like that, right? I mean, we know how to construct unitary representations. That's basically the problem of quantization. And when you do that to this compact phase space, you get Finite, dim uh, finite dimensional matrices. This is called sometimes called the fuzzy sphere. So you replace your, your smooth sphere with an algebra of matrices. It's like the simplest example of a non-commutative geometry. And practically what that means is that, uh, is that if you replace any one of these, these S diff generators with a quantization, you get an, S, an N by N matrix uh, and the set of these matrices reproduces the algebra of S diff uh, in terms of its structure constants up to one over N corrections. This is a famous, famous result from the, uh, I think it was discovered thinking about, about membranes uh, in string theory. So, but what it, what it suggests in this gravitational context, we're sort of taking this string, we're sort of suggesting you take the string membrane and think about it more like a, well, like a membrane paradigm, GR membrane. And it suggests a regularization of our symmetry group where you could replace this, if you can replace this little group S diff with an SUN, you'd have something where the diffeomorphism symmetry is, is regularized. So you have a finite dimensional Lie group, but the diffeomorphism symmetry is unbroken. It's deformed by these one over N corrections, but, but it still closes. And I think that would be a very interesting uh, I think that's a very interesting prospect that one could actually quantize these things without breaking the diff symmetry. But the big question is, okay, we know we can do this for the little group. And then the question is, can you actually lift this deformation, this quantization to the full uh, symmetry algebra? Uh, so that's something that 
uh, that Laurent and Anthony and Farouk are, and I are uh, working on. Okay, so just to sum up, um, we'd shown in previous work that general relativity in a region with a co-dimension two boundary S has a specific symmetry algebra. It takes the form of this semi-direct sum. And in this work, we classified its co-adjoint orbits. And this is sort of the important first step toward quantization and constructing irreducible representations of the symmetry. And it tells us what the invariants are and, uh, and the generators that give us a classical phase space that is that we can then attempt to quantize this. And we found this interesting analogy with hydrodynamics. Indeed, the orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with orbits of hydrodynamics in one lower dimension where the surface area uh, course, uh, corresponds to the fluid mass and the outer curvature of the surface corresponds to the fluid vertices. So thank you. All right, I uh, propose that we all unmute our mics and we thank William one more time. So, or thank, thank you out loud, <laughs> not one more time. <laughs> And uh, now the floor is open. I, I just wanted to make a little comment about your uh, little uh, regularization by using um, matrices. Uh, Willie Fischler and I have been using that in the holographic space-time models um, for quite some time. So uh, that, that yeah. part of it is, is something that, that we have incorporated and I, I suspect that the SL2R piece has to do with the fact which we have not succeeded in doing of uh, incorporating Lorentz transformations into that formalism. And so the, this actually sounds very interesting. I'm looking forward to your paper on the generalization of fuzzy spheres to SL2R. Oh yeah, great. Yes, uh, th yeah. So thanks for mentioning this this holographic space time. It's it, it, indeed it's a it's um it is a, a point. I, I should have mentioned it. Indeed, we have we have that point in common. Um, maybe I can say one. Well, okay. I I don't know how to do diffs yet. I know how to do area preserving diffs and SL two R. And actually, the the uh, the group you get is very nice. It's just S U N N. So it's it's S U N, but uh, it's matrices that preserve an indefinite Hermitian form. Uh, and if you think about that group, it has SUN in it, and it also has SL2R in it, because SL2R is SU11. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of a natural. They, so the, uh, you can go part, part of the way to get the full diffs that I don't know. Yet. More questions? I may stop the recording now so that people who feel somewhat embarrassed to ask their questions in a permanent way can uh, feel less worried. So I'm gonna stop and then maybe I'll leave the floor open afterwards. So thanks again, Will.